so uh, I'll just jump in. To start this talk, I want to dispel the, the myth of the lone genius. So behind many innovations, there's a story of collective participation and invention, the stories that never get told. Nikola Tesla was not the only inventor of his time. He competed with Edison. Both of them had big teams of people working with them to, to sort of investigate radio technology. Um, the same is true in art and culture. Avatar was not the sole creation of James Cameron. Uh, in fact, nearly 3,000 people worked on this film. And there's many examples like this in science and art where groups of people come together to create something greater than any one person could. And I don't think any of us would um, ever believe that James Cameron was the only person working on this. Um, but I think it's the, the what's happening right now online and through, through different technologies that allow people to come together at scale through technology that brings the idea of how we can assemble lots of people together solving problems into a fresh focus. So we know about uh, Wikipedia and millions of people working together to produce the largest, cheapest encyclopedia. Galaxy Zoo, where science fans categorize different images. Or the Foldit project, where um, gamers get in, uh, into folding proteins and uh, coming up with unique combinations that actually inform laboratory science. Um, and these are all very clever ways to motivate small contributions from many people that, in aggregate, lead to something really great. But the question that interests me is how can we harness this collective effort, energy, and intelligence to innovate on problems facing society? Um, and so can we take that, uh, that social networking, crowdsourcing, um, sort of organizational, dynamic organizational, uh, pro those processes and point them at problems that, that we need to solve. Um, so to help frame the potential of this idea, I'm gonna share a personal experience I had a couple years back. I was at a conference called CHI. Wait, you guys probably know about CHI, right? CHI, it's a, a large multi-track conference. Um, 3,000 people or so attend every year. Um, and I was sitting in a talk where it was totally crowded. People were spilling out into the hallway, sitting in the aisleways. Um, and there were rooms right down the hall where the room could have, the, the talk could have been shuffled in over there. And you know, a much larger room that had lots of empty seats could have shifted over to this room. Um, and the organizers didn't do anything wrong, per se. They just didn't know ahead of time what was going to be popular. What did people want to go see? Um, so I got really interested in this problem and got to go observe the planning process for the conference and took note of how tangible this process was and collaborative. Um, basically, they had a big wall of paper, and each little uh, square is a session, and each tiny little piece of pink or blue or green paper is a paper that just got accepted to the conference. And they would do this right after the PC, the paper committee, decided what papers got into the conference. And so it was this massive scheduling task that they had to do. 16 parallel tracks over four days. And what they created was flawed in many ways. They had no information. Um, they recorded no information about how papers related outside of their particular session. And they had, again, no information about what was going to be popular, of course, at the conference. But what would happen is they would make this preliminary schedule, and then weeks later, someone would email them and say, hey, I can't make it on Monday. Uh, or, you know, you scheduled my, I, I just want to make sure you don't schedule my, my talk here uh, at the same time as another talk that I have. And so all these constraints started to come up from the community. And because they have no information, if they want to make a swap to another place, it's bound to cause other problems for other people. So any one solution could make disruptions, unknown consequences of, of making a swap to some other part of the schedule. Scheduling, in many ways, is a wicked problem. And I mean that both kind of informally and in a formal sense. Um, and Riddle and Weber coined this term wicked problem to refer to problems that are so interconnected due to social, political, economic factors that 
any one solution that satisfies one stakeholder is bound to create a problem for another stakeholder. It's an, a woven system of problems, if you will. And they went on to define wicked problems as ones that have no right or wrong solutions. Um, they only d differ in their degree of goodness or badness. Um, they're problems where different st stakeholders often have different views on, the, on how to frame the problem. So they have different worldviews, and, and that causes them to think about the problem differently. Um, the constraints of the problem change over time. And the problem really is never solved. And so conference scheduling, and scheduling perhaps more generally, may not be as wicked as some of the political socio technical challenges that uh, Riddle and Weber were talking about. But it's certainly complicated by different points of view and, and by hidden information, information that's going on in the community that never reached the level of the planners, the people at the top who are supposed to be creating this event, designing this experience for 3,000 people. And, and so this is where I came in and found some great collaborators in Lydia and in Hao Chi Zhang and Rob Miller and Juho Kim and Paul Andre to create a system that would tap into that information embedded in the community. We created a series of interfaces where we can engage the different populations of people. Um, and so in the first stage, right after the program committee decided what papers got into the conference, we would engage them in a basically a digital paper sorting method where we could get affinity information, how papers relate to each other. And it was just a simple um, dragging solutions onto a, a pane and then deciding what you think makes a good session. And then if you get enough people doing that, you start to realize what the relationships are between papers. To further refine that, we took that affinity information and gave it um, and, and used it to pick a top 10 list of papers that relate to the particular author's paper. So the author is actually the one who knows best whether other papers relate to their own. And so we asked them, you know, is this OK in your session? Not OK in your session? Is this a paper that you would like to attend if you had the choice? And then we took all that information and fed it into this scheduling tool that the organizers could use to see all those constraints and preferences from the community, and then to solve some of the, the hard and soft constraints that are necessarily in conflict, but it suggests different swaps that could be made. Um, and so finally, the nice thing about doing that is now we have all this data about how each paper in the conference relates to each other. So we can feed that information into a, a mobile app. So this is a tool called Confer created by uh, Anant and David Carger at MIT to um, allow attendees to go and like the papers they want to see. And then because we've got all this information about how papers relate, it immediately starts providing useful recommendations and doesn't suffer from the bootstrapping problem of the first few people not having recommendations for them. Um, so we turn this process into uh, this digital process. Essentially, we've transformed this messy paper-based process into a digital process. Um, we took a process that normally takes months because of all the uh, emails and, and back and forth people have to do and the wrangling of the schedule and really worked it into kind of an afternoon of intensive planning. Um, and this was the process used by two of our main conferences for a few years. I think they've fallen back to using spreadsheets and undergrads, um, which I think is a larger challenge of, of sort of research software um, getting adopted into a uh, volunteer community. Um, that it, it's hard to, to pass things on from year to year. But you can find out more about this project at Project Kobe. Um, and so coming back to this question of collective innovation, the hypothesis here is that we can harness the collective energy and intelligence and creativity of people and solve bigger problems. But we're not 
just going to throw a bunch of people into a, into a forum and see what comes out. You know, we don't want to have the too many cooks in the kitchen problem. What we're focused on is how do we create fairly confined and well-structured interactions for people to contribute in many different ways and to coordinate those. And so the question that really interests me is how can we scale out design practices? And one approach is to uh, teach a lot of people how to do design. And I think that's, that's an approach that um, they advocate in the D school here. It's an approach that my colleague Scott Clemmer has really thought a lot about in terms of scaling up and teaching many, many learners. Our tact is a little bit different in that I'm really interested in how do we bring lots of people together to solve a problem together. And we're looking at a number of strategies where people are collaboratively looking at the, these wicked problems. Um, so this notion of a system of constraints, that's something we saw in the, the, the Kobe project, right? This idea that part of a solution a uh, notion of collective innovation is to figure out what the community needs and, and sort of tap into all the th things that people think about and, and sort of prefer in coming up and shaping a solution for that community. Um, this notion was actually a concern that Riddle and Weber talked about, going back to the wicked problem idea. Um, they actually talked about how it was the designer's job to identify constraints within the context that they're trying to solve. And, um, you know, of course, if you don't have any constraints, it's just a blank canvas, um, that often is not enough to get, help you kind of move in a direction. But sort of the opposite problem is that you have no constraints and you're left to wander everywhere. But what they were really concerned about is this notion of a tightly constrained space where you go out and you need find and you learn about all the problems. And, um, you know, if, if they're not too constrained, you can use optimization, you know, the oper operational researchers would be able to formulate a mathematical function to be able to solve this problem. Um, designers don't quite think about it in, in such mathematical terms. But what they talked about was that in many wicked problems, those constraints are so tight and have collapsed so much that there are literally no solutions that, that would solve that problem for all the stakeholders. And, and so, Interestingly, um, one of Riddle's former students, Riddle was a professor at Berkeley uh, in the uh, urban planning department. Um, and one of his students, Jeff Nickerson, told me that Riddle would teach his students not to abide by the constraints. He would teach them to push back against the constraints and would teach these exercises where you would evaluate each constraint and then try to figure out how you could go back to that stakeholder or flip it on, it on the other end and, and push it back so that we could finally carve out a potential solution. Um, designers would understand that constraints are socially constructed. You know, these are constraints put on by other people, preferences, desires, needs, and that likewise they could be deconstructed. They could be taken back. Um, and so I think a key technology or strategy under that idea of collective innovation is how can we use technology to discover constraints ahead of time as much as possible, uh, or to discover them throughout an ongoing process of, of need finding and understanding a problem. Um, and in the case of scheduling a large conference, it's really important to understand those ahead of time because the event only happens once and you, your, your planning or your design of the schedule needs to happen ahead of time. But in the case of other design settings, we can structure it around getting feedback. So you can have proposals for solutions and then get input from your stakeholders on the other side. Um, and so, you know, this is partly why a studio crit environment has become such a standard practice in design and project-based learning because it's one of the key mechanisms for how people learn in a very open-ended problem-solving setting when there are no right or wrong solutions. And 
that requires sort of input from lots of different people to help understand in a very fluid way, not like the mathematical operational research way, but in a very fluid way, what sort of concerns people have. And so a key question that drove our research here was, how can we scale up feedback practices, make them easier for people to get feedback, make it uh, fast to get feedback, and to get a diverse representative pool of feedback providers. And so I started giving my students in my design courses assignments where they would come up with ideas and then throw them up on the web, kind of like a giant sounding board. Um, so for example, students in my startup studio class would create storyboards. And then they would put the storyboards, we still do this now, we put the storyboards up on Google Forms and go out and recruit you know, feedback providers, hopefully um, not just your friends, but people who are involved in uh, the problem that you're trying to solve and see what ideas resonate with people. There's this concept that um, Anand Day and John Zimmerman and other folks at CMU invented called speed dating, where it was a paper-based sort of feedback process where you cycle through a bunch of ideas like storyboards. Um, so we kind of took that idea and, and thought about how do you do that online. And feedback providers would either write text to respond or they would leave a video. Um, the use of video-based feedback was leading us to capture some of the more uh, nuanced emotional reactions to ideas. But the intu intuition here pedagogically is that we're trying to get students out of the classroom. We're trying to get students to look beyond the traditional boundaries of the classroom as a place for getting feedback from your peer, or from your instructor, and to go to the client, go to the customer, go to the user who's going to um, be affected by these design ideas. And so taking that concept a step further, what we had students do is, as a early stage design activity, create a home page for their new startup, their new app idea. And that's all they've done so far. They, there's no app that has been developed. All they've done is created a simple web page. And then we teach them and give them a little bit of money to go out and advertise their startup. And so they're learning about SEO, search engine optimization. They're um, playing around with Google Analytics and AdWords. And what they're trying to find out is, is anyone searching on those terms and interested enough in the web ad that you put up there that they're going to click on it and go find out if they can get that app? Is there a need out there? Can you, can you measure some sort of need that exists? The other kind of nifty thing you can do is you can A-B test while you're there. So you put an ad out there, and then you can randomly send people to two variations of your nascent app idea and see if there's certain branding that appeals to somebody, you know, appeals to people more, or even test two different concepts. And, and of course, you get a lot of data from this. And you can, um, while maybe not statistically significant, you can use the data to drive decisions and really teach the students um, about the data-driven design world, um, all before building an actual prototype. So in another project, my former postdoc, Kurt Luther, tried to meet this demand for feedback by creating a tool that would generate feedback at demand on scale. And he called it CrowdCrit. And designers could submit a design idea, and then um, it would recruit people online to provide feedback. And one of the key features in this tool is that it would take principles of the design domain, in this case it was visual design, and try to embed it in the tool. And so that feedback providers, regardless of their level of expertise, would have a very structured process for how to provide good feedback in this domain. And so you can see uh, here's a poster for a concert. And uh, the feedback provider could go through and look at these kind of pre-authored um, statements that one could apply to the design. And then um, they could adapt them if they wanted to, as well as put uh, annotations on the design. So it's very much designed for visual, graphical designs. But it could also, I think, apply to product design, um, to any sort of representation that you can throw up on the web and have people look at. I think the same con conceptual principles still would work here. 
And then after you get a bunch of feedback from different stakeholders, we provided a visualization where you could go and um, look at the, the, the kind of different feedback that you have, positive and negative. You could click in and see more details. You could look at who is providing the feedback and really get a sense of the different, um, different reactions to your design ideas. And so our work is not only developing these novel interfaces, it's trying to evaluate them and run um, studies through these systems. And so we've been running numerous experiments on factors related to scale, to structuring critiques, to the social dynamics that emerge during feedback exchange. One of the early things that we learned was that the number of feedback providers led designers to identify a larger number of issues. Um, so as you add more feedback providers, you get closer and closer to what experts would see in a design. It does have some diminishing return, but there's some, some claim at least that we're um, the scale and diversity of, of networks of people, whether it's crowdsourcing or a community, provide value for feedback exchange. We also collected data on the benefits of using these scaffolded rubrics. James. Feedback to know, like maybe it will ask them to faster in terms of finding the serious problems or something like that. Um, the, kind of curious the tricky part about evaluating feedback is you either have the just the opinion of the feedback receiver, which is what I was about to show. What we measured was how the feedback receiver valued the feedback, or you have to measure the impact of that feedback on subsequent designs and then measure the pre post effect of the before and after design. And we tried many variations of this, and it's really, really hard. Correct. So like here, what I was going to explain is um, we had people rate the feedback. How helpful was it on a scale from 1 to 10? And uh, what this data shows is that experts are generally better at providing feedback than novices. Um, if you give the experts a rubric, they don't really benefit from that. But if you give novices this rubric, they increase uh, rati the ratings of their feedback they provide increase. So if you want data, here's some, here's some data that structure actually in the rubric actually helps provide better feedback. But that's feedback as judged by a novice. As judged by a novice and by, by experts. Experts had the same. The person receiving it, the, I think the person receiving is, is the most important, actually. We can discuss that a bit. We also measured it from uh, an instructor's perspective, which also back, back this up. But I actually think it's the receiver that's a more important um, opinion, a judge of this, because they're the ones that have to integrate that feedback, understand what it means. They're the ones that determine how helpful it is. But it's a very different question of, is it actually more helpful? Um, and like I said, we, we've been exploring that and tried different things. And um, this is a project actually with Manish and Bjorn Hartman from Berkeley. And we tried many studies like this, and it was, it was fun. But um, we definitely learned some things about rubrics. One of the things that we did was a follow-up linguistic analysis. Uh, what was in that feedback that was powerful or that was resonating? What were the patterns in the feedback? And so our analysis showed that um, features that correlated highly with high ratings by the receivers of the feedback were things like obvious things like, OK, the longer the feedback, the better it was rated. But also more emotional words being used, um, more specificity in the words that were used rather than vague, higher level terms, and using more of a suggestion approach, like giving people action-oriented feedback was, was preferred. And the rubrics help to increase those types of features. So shifting from feedback from this online exchange platform to an in-class in, in, in a physical setting, uh, that, that sort of setting that we have here, um, my PhD student Amy Shannon from CMU is very interested in how to, um, how to take advantage of the fact that in many North American classrooms at least, most people have some sort of device 
on them. Um, I see a lot of people with paper, that's good, and, and not too many people with their laptops open. But everyone probably has at least this on them. And so can we take advantage of that to make the classroom more interactive, to make it a much more participatory setting? And so Peer Presents encourages students to collaboratively comment when a peer is up presenting their, their ideas. And so instead of having somebody in the back of the classroom who doesn't get to raise their hand, um, whether it's due to time or shyness, we can still capture their, their point of view. And the tool offers some nice features in terms of how do you get fast feedback um, and to do that feedback exchange in a short amount of time um, and how to, um, how to prep the, the students who, so how, how to get the students who are about to present to articulate what they want feedback on ahead of time so that when they go and do that feedback exchange, it's most valuable for them. So I think there's a lot of potential here, not just in feedback exchange, but in terms of when you have a captive audience in a room together, what are the different learning activities or collective innovation activities that we can do together to work on difficult problems? So I think we've made pretty good progress on this idea of rapid feedback from diverse stakeholders. Um, but there's still a lot to learn about how we can better support designers to interpret and reflect on feedback, especially when we have a lot of conflicting points of view, which is what we learned is another thing we get when we go at a scale. Um, how things like social capital and self-efficacy affect feedback exchange. Um, and so kind of taking a step back at this point, um, I love this conceptual model for design first introduced by Paul LaSalle. Um, he explained how designers move through these phases of elaborating on a problem and then reducing the number of possible outcomes. And it's a really powerful way of thinking about a design process as having both a convergence stage and a divergence stage. And you can see it in many of the you know, exercises that we teach in design classes and um, IDEO, for example, has adopted this. The D school has adopted, adopted this notion, at least conceptually. That's sort, sort of the thinking behind it. Um, but when folks like LaSalle and Buxton were, were thinking about this, it was mostly thinking about individuals or small teams of people. And, but I also find it very useful in thinking about how groups of people, larger groups of people, can come together to look at problems. Um, so, for example, I think the Kobe project was a good example of expanding the possibilities, expanding the notion of, of, of expanding at least the information that we have available for understanding the problem. It's sort of a discovery process. Um, online feedback is a process of converging because you've got some options on the table and you're trying to refine those. You're trying to choose maybe between different options. A natural place to also think about how to apply this model is in the space of generating ideas. And so essentially brainstorming at scale. The idea of brainstorming has been around since the 1940s. Um, but as soon as computers came around, folks were talking about electronic brainstorming and how can we, how can we get people to brainstorm at a, you know, at a terminal. This is a, from a very early paper, 1992. Um, but the, uh, the kind of long-standing lab result that, that a lot of these early electronic brainstorming studies show is that when you have people in a room together brainstorming, they get slowed down by each other. They produce fewer ideas than if you have people generate ideas independently working by themselves. And so that's, that's a result that's been replicated lots and lots that the um, the number of unique ideas increases when, uh, as your group size increases, if you have some sort of electronic medium that allows people to generate ideas in parallel. And if you have a traditional brainstorming setting, group size, you know, kind of, you, you plateau. You don't get any more ideas, or more unique ideas when you increase the number of people. Um, of course, 
Stanford's Bob Hutt Sutton and, and Andrew Hargadon make the connection uh, observation that there's other reasons why you brainstorm besides um, just coming up with lots of unique ideas. Teams, you know, bond, they get to know each other's superpowers. There's good reasons for why you still want to do the in-person physical brainstorming. Um, yet, we're still seeing a resurgence of this idea of electronic brainstorming, what's referred to today as collaborative ideation. And so you see systems like OpenIDO um, that engages uh, people interested in social innovation challenges, um, participatory budgeting um, projects like the city of Cambridge who got their residents to generate ideas for how to spend the budget. Got a question? Yeah. Um, so I took, a, I took a musical class yeah. recently and I was under the impression all along that if you have people working alone to come up with ideas, then they can get stuck in their own mind. But then if you're working in a group, uh, you see someone else's idea, you can build off of it. Yeah. And so there would be a tendency to not get stuck. And I experienced that myself also when I was brainstorming with my group. That's the opposite of what you just said. So I'm wondering if you had, what, what was your initial hypothesis and why, why am I wrong? <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah, if you're, I mean, I'm still telling the story here, building up to it, but you're right. If, if we just believe that result and decided, okay, we're all gonna, uh, we're never gonna meet together in person and get inspired from each other, then uh, that would be a pretty boring world to live in. And we're not even talking about the goodness of these ideas. We're talking about the uniqueness of the ideas. But there is something about you know independently coming up with things so that you you don't let things like um, groupthink take over the conversation or uh, being fixated on an idea because it seems like a good one. So there is some value, I think, in at least at some point in the in the process, having people independently think about the problem, because we all have something going on up here. If we can capture that first and then bring in the social aspect. Um, and my point about systems like this is that it's clearly exposing you to other people's ideas. You see them in lists when you go to visit the site. So um, it's not as social as a physical brainstorm, but you're being exposed to other people's ideas. And, and actually, that's kind of my point here, is that a lot of these systems, while they do expose people to others' ideas, what comes out um, tends to be a lot of repetitive ideas and a lot of very mundane ideas. And it's something about how these ideas are just kind of listed out and, and people can borrow from them or um, being exposed to mundane and repetitive ideas kind of then leads to, to more redundant and mundane ideas. Um, so to try to combat that, um, my postdoc, Joelle Chan, created an interface where people could all generate ideas in parallel. Um, and then at some point, we would take all those ideas and surface them into a dashboard interface that a expert could use to um, provide inspiration in the source of, uh, in, the, in the form of like other examples that are good or schemas that seem useful or other ways of thinking about the problem. They would be watching the space of ideas emerge and then coming up with ways of facilitating it on the fly in real time. And we found that they, it did lead to more creative ideas. The Challenge here was how to scale it. So the expert was good at facilitating maybe tens of parallel ideators. But when it gets to be much more than that, it's really hard to keep track of all the different directions that the brainstorm is going and to be able to really personalize it for the different people generating ideas. And so how do we scale this to like hundreds or thousands of people generating ideas? And so to build on this insight, um, to, to Think about this problem. We, we started with the insight that designers often arrange their ideas spatially, uh, like on a whiteboard. Once you have a bunch of ideas, you start to cluster them, make those affinity uh, relationships between ideas. And so how we started this was um, um, thinking about how to scale this up to 
and build a, basically a computational model of all the ideas that are emerging. And this is work that I was doing with uh, Pau Singida Lu and Krzysztof Gaios at, at Harvard. I actually just got back from Pau's um, dissertation defense on Monday. She did a great job. Um, and so the idea here was, well, what if we can watch how each individual brainstormer generates ideas and then places them within their local um, pain, their, their own workspace, and see how they arrange ideas, and then also occasionally throw in other people's ideas that they can arrange alongside their own. And then from all that relationship, uh, all those relationships build a sparse similarity matrix between the, between the ideas. It's actually very similar to what we were doing with the Kobe project, trying to determine how papers relate. How do these ideas relate? And we, we, uh, we then use that to create a low dimensional map, an idea map that sort of gives us a, a simple represent, representation of how all the ideas relate. Um, this is sort of the experience of the user in this scenario. They um, are generating their own ideas, and occasionally they, they get other ideas thrown into the mix, and they can kind of arrange them in their own space. And then conceptually, what we can do with this computational model is then sample that space for either very similar ideas or very diverse ideas. We can be deliberate about how we want to inspire people to explore the problem space. Maybe we want to. Um, there's a rare idea up here that we want people to go and populate with, with near variants of it. Um, one of the studies we did found that people who saw these automatically generated diverse examples tended to generate more diverse ideas. Um, and so it's this idea of can we, as we're, as we're working together to generate ideas, also synthesize them. Part of it is we need to get there anyway to be able to create some sort of overview of the space and to better understand what the best possibilities are. But also we can take, those, take that computational model and use it to kind of feed back into the system to, to help inspire people as they're going along. Um, this is a very kind of geeky, algorithmic way of thinking about the problem. And I think there's a lot of, there's a social dimension here that, that somewhat gets lost, and that's sort of where I'm interested in exploring now, is how to bring in um, real social networks of people that know each other and, and who have some notion of um, how, the, how smart the other person is or what expertise the other people have in and, and accounting for um, what solutions you want to show to other people. Um, but it's, I think it's a fun research angle, and there's a lot of directions to continue to explore this. So what have we been learning about collective innovation? I think there's a couple of things that we, we do. It's sort of uh, principles that are starting to emerge, or strategies that seem to work well. Um, discovering constraints and preferences at scale. Obtaining feedback from multiple stakeholders. Exploring many solution paths in parallel and also then generating and synthesizing those ideas into, into um, you know, making sense of at scale all the complex information that's necessarily part of these wicked problems. Um, also thinking a lot about how once you get down to it and you're trying to maybe put a solution out there for many users, you have to make a decision. Is there a process by which you can um, facilitate a large group of people to make a rational decision, not just voting, but a staged voting process. And I'm coming to understand different notions of the meaning of collective, whether it's an existing community of people like the, the academic community or a crowd that you can just dial up on the internet, um, or collaboration between teams of people. Um, I think this, this scenario of people meeting physically in a space um, and the fact that they all have some technology with them provides new opportunities for how we can get people solving problems together. And I worry about the scenario of people just shouting at each other. Like we've seen the, the town halls recently of people with their, their signs. They have like 
red sheet of paper, you know, disagree and green, I agree, and there's just yelling at each other. Um, but I think there's opportunities here as designers of tools that help people solve problems together to do better. And so I'm pretty excited and serious about the idea of applying these strategies to problems in our civics. And right now what we're working on is, is thinking about this combination of design thinking, crowdsourcing, decision making, and how it might apply itself to big social problems in a city. And we just started this organization called D4SD. Um, it's a public engagement platform that seeks to gather um, different citizens' perspectives on problems and, and applying the design approach to these problems. And we've been working on this with a bunch of, um, I was explaining at lunch, like we have an army of undergrads who have gone out like tentacles to under, you know, research this one civic challenge. And this year we're looking at mobility, um, just going out and discovering people's stories about um, problems with public transit or with traffic. Um, and not just to carve out their own one little solution, but to think about the myriad of problems within that challenge and to start making connections across those problems. And to, of course, then to eventually generate ideas. We're actually still in the need finding stage and trying to keep everyone going out and investigating and but staying aware of all the things that other people are finding. It's a big coordination problem. Um, and so I have a lot of things I could talk about with this. I think it's a really uh, fun challenge to think about how to eventually get the you know, citizens, residents engaged in this process right now. We, we've mostly focused on having undergrads because they're, they're a source of that intelligence and, and energy that's ready to jump in and, and participate. But I think there's a possibility to get people in from, out, you know, from the city as well. Um, and I'd love to hear any ideas that you guys have on, on how we can do that better. And of course, I'm inspired by the work that's going on at Stanford and Michael Bernstein is a, uh, a colleague and a competitor in the space, but uh, I wish he was here to debate this stuff with. But that's basically my talk, and thank you. Love to start a conversation. Yes, sir. On your last uh, uh, point, um, there's a young uh, instructor here at Stanford who's working, has been working with the uh, city of San Jose on uh, similar issues um, and uh, they used an uh, approach that I've worked on um, called mess mapping which has to do with addressing uh, wicked problems which I've used with county and, and, and larger communities over the world. Um, you might want to get in touch with him and touch base on, on the different ways. What's his name? Don't remember his name. Okay. I'll give you his name yeah, later. Sounds good. Yeah. Oh, uh, so um, you had earlier like like something about like um, it 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 told that was like you, allowing people to to use their like laptops and stuff to engage with like the yeah. classroom, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and so of course like there's also these other like problems. If like a device used in the classroom, right? It's like you know, like people are bad multitaskers and like yep. all easily get distracted. Uh, like like like, did like the did the benefits end up like outweighing the uh, the um, those distractions? Yeah. Well, I think it 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 is depends. It depends, um, and I think it takes a bit of um, it takes the instructor understanding that there's going to be that other distractor that uh, the tendency of people to get sucked into their Facebook or whatever. And, um, and so there has to be a bit of mediation um, around the physical setting. Maybe it's TAs walking around and making sure people are actually participating. Um, but I think in large, people like it a lot, especially the people receiving feedback. In fact, I, I did this thing, the first two assignments this quarter, and then the third assignment, students were asking why we weren't doing it, because I wanted to try it without it. And, um, in this third assignment, they were doing like role plays in the front of the classroom, so I thought the laptops would be getting in the way. 
Um, but they were actually like, well, we really liked being able to do that. Um, so I think, I think it does depend. Um, I do think there's a sort of a design challenge with technology. When you have a laptop, even if you're just working in a team, I, I've experienced this a lot where I get annoyed when someone's looking at their computer and I'm like trying to talk to them. Um, but it's not that they're ignoring me necessarily, it's just it's communicated as they're ignoring me. And tablets help out in a little bit, uh, help out a bit because you can set it on the table and you can see what they're looking at and see if it's related to what you're even talking about. But um, so I, do, I think there's kind of a fun technology challenge there in designing to better facilitate social interactions while still doing work together. Because I do, th I've, I've also had the experience where we're sitting around the laptop and you know everybody's tuned in and you know everybody's working on the same thing and that there's, there's really something powerful, like even if you're just in a Google Doc um, and you, you know everyone's doing their part, the fluidity of being able to have verbal conversation and also the gesture and nonverbal interaction together with the technology, I think there is a direction there that we should keep investigating and improving. Lydia? Yeah, um, this is really exciting. Um, one of the sort of magic ingredients that I saw here was, was rubrics. Um, and uh, it was in a, in a couple different solutions. And so my broad question is like, why do you think those work so well? And I'll preface that by saying, I, I, although I do believe them a lot, they do have this bad case where I have to re-engineer my thoughts to backfit the rubric. <laughs> um, I, Can you explain it, that part a little bit? Well, so when I grade students on the rubric, I know this is bad, how do I? <laughs> <laughs> figure out mm -hmm. how to say, you know, because sometimes it, but m most usually uh, it helps. But I just want to know if there's any yeah. process, like what you, why you think a rubric helps. Well, I have to say, I haven't looked at assessment. I think that's an important distinction. I didn't look at assessment, I looked at feedback. Very formative, informal, help me shape my design idea, rather than trying to actually judge it. And so I, I, I don't know, I, I agree, I, in a personal experience, yeah. <laughs> I tried to justify uh, grades in a backwards way, like you suggest. But why do rubrics work? Um, much like a good task description on crowdsourcing focuses people on the thing that you actually want them to do and, and um, embodies what the, the, the wisdom that has been sort of harvested in a domain and tries to boil it down to its essence, and then communicates that very, very clearly. I think there's an art to it, how to do it right. I think it's taking, the, yeah, basically it's taking the wisdom of domain and trying to bring it down to its essence so that you can use that as a way of structuring um, how to do a task, a very particular task of providing feedback. I think that's essentially how it, how it works. But, yeah. Uh, would there be a way to measure if, if the rubric is introducing bias or, or reducing creativity. You know, like a maybe test, uh, like checking if it is better. Because the, the receivers of the feedback say that, that the feedback is better, but you don't know if the feedback is better or not until you implement it in the app and you see the effect on the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. actual customers. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what James was asking about. I. We tried with the CrowdCrit study to measure whether the feedback that they received actually led to better visual designs. And we found no significant difference. However, you got to keep in mind that we're measuring the difference between a, a first version of a poster and a second version of the poster. And we're trying to see if these folks over here in this other condition, their improvements were their, their improvements, you know, significantly better than so I think as a, from, a, from a scientific standpoint, we need better, um, be, better ways of kind of exploring that, better basically paradigms, experimental paradigms to be able to look at the more subtle things that could be affecting that exchange. Is it a big problem with the interpretation of the feedback? Absolutely. Yeah, it's not as straight as reading and translating. I think there is yeah. a, a, an intermediate step there well, you have to do the right interpretation of Absolutely, yeah. And I, so Amy Shannon's tool has a, has a 
nice interaction once you have all the feedback for how do you sort it, um, what things are you going to try to address now, try to address later, what things you're going to ignore. Um, I think that anecdotally, I talk about how people, as they learn to become designers, actually transition from a place where they don't want to share their work. Like they're not ready to get feedback. They're, they have a lot of social inhibition to getting feedback to a place where they can then feel more comfortable getting feedback to a place where they can then provide feedback for other people to a place where they crave getting feedback and they feel like it's really important to get feedback to I think at an expert level, knowing that you don't have to get feedback and everything that you can you can sort of simulate what your users are going to think and you can project forward to some extent so you don't have to waste resources getting feedback. There's a social capital of that exchange, especially when you go to your instructors and ask them for feedback. You can't do that every hour. They're going to ignore you at some point. Sure. Yeah. Going back to that point of rubrics and especially what you said about experts being able to simulate that, I feel like if you're if you're measuring the impact of these different kinds of feedback, once you give people such a good rubric and you think that it is a good rubric because it is reducing the mm -hmm. field, don't you also have to check if just giving people the rubric to self-check themselves with, like neuristic evaluation, like a checklist, produces the same effect? Ah, so we actually did that study. It was a paper called Shepherding the Crowd. And in fact, doing the self-evaluation with the rubric led to just as, uh, as good a performance as having an external person provide the feedback. Um, and that was in a crowdsourcing context, and, and, and I don't know if the same thing would be true in a design setting, but I think it also makes that point that I was just making that it largely depends on the individual, how they interpret it, how they emotionally react to it, um, how, uh, how much knowledge they have to really um, make sense of it and to figure out how to act on it. Um, I have this great video. So I used to be a postdoc here. I, I did, I did uh, basically Lydia's job <laughs> when I was here. And uh, I did these studies in the basement down the hall where people would come in and do design studies, um, where we had them make ad designs, visual ad designs, so stuff like this, where they produced a lot of different uh, visual designs. I see Wendy back there. She was um, the one of the, were you the founder of Amidextrous magazine? Yeah, so we use Amidextrous as a client for one of these studies. And one of the things that we realized in, in sort of providing feedback on their visual designs of participants is they would, they would emotionally react. And so here's just an example. Actually, I don't have the audio in there, but we'll see how it does. These guys, you know, are telling me that I am completely, you know, doing something wrong here. So it took me a while to get past the, I'm a failure at this, and to, well, okay, how can I go about fixing it in the way that they suggest? So there was a, a short period where there was emotional response overwhelmed any positive, like, logical impact that this ended up having. It's funny that I have the CMU thing in the corner, and this was done at Stanford, and now I'm at UCSD. Anyway, um, so a lot of, I think I've been recognizing for a while that a lot of it does come down to how individuals bring in information and, and sort of, um, to me, it's, it's this layered thing. It's we're, we are studying the individual, but we're also trying to think about how those individual effects can be put together at a, at a scale to like get to a better place. And so um, we're looking at team formation, I think, as a, as a key component of this. You have a big people, big group of people who want to participate in, in solving a problem. Can we figure out the best ways to kind of put them together and to support their team effort? And then it gets down to like the group level, somewhere between individual and, and scale. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things that makes design so hard is that the Especially hurt. teaching it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and doing it, teaching it, all those things. Um, 
And I, I don't think that's just, oh, because humans are emotional. I'm like, no, because like the reason you took this idea is you have to get a little invested in it, even if it's paper. Yeah. And then backtracking is sort of my AI, the way I conceptualize it, is just hard. It, 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 and it takes time. And I wonder if you think this is something that we can address, uh, whether it can be automated, whether you've thought about tackling this specifically. Of oh, the emotional reaction to it? Yeah. Um, I don't know what the technology solution is, but I, I've come to deal with this in my classes, and it's and it's you know it's coaching, I think is what it is. It's that helping people realize that um, first that feedback is important. We can do that through um, experimental evidence. Uh, we can do that eventually through kind of um, we can show case studies, and we can sh you know have people kind of learn it by feeling it and, and getting good feedback. But then it's also you know, teaching them that you can invest in the process and the goal that you're trying to solve a problem, but not into a particular solution. So a variation on this, on this work that we did was really focused on um, how do we get people to distribute their investments across multiple ideas in parallel? Because if you are invested in one idea and you get, that, you get critiqued on that, then you're going to react like this guy. Um, but if you've got at least a couple of ideas on the table and you get critiqued on one of them, you have another one. Or if, you know, people can start commenting on how you can combine the best elements of them. The emotional angle is, is the, emotional, the negative emotional reaction is dulled to some extent. It has a lot of other benefits too in terms of comparing and contrasting and being able to see a thematic um, trajectory of your designs in a way that a single design doesn't allow. Last question. I just want to add on that because I feel like one of the confounding factors is that usually you teach students the design process at the same time as you teach them the mechanics of visual design and all that stuff. And I found like, especially for myself, once I got over learning, learning how to use the tools and being much faster, it just your emotional investment in like a specific design becomes so much smaller mm -hmm. that the emotional aspect becomes That's easier right. just That's by right. the fact of like, yeah, it just took me five minutes. For two. Yeah, yeah, and it, you know, a professional designer is quick to throw out ideas if they quick, you know, and they're, they're, I'm always teaching my students to, um, this is a key point, is to th figure out what's the biggest risk or the biggest assumption behind your idea. And then devise a prototype or an experiment or a user study to test that assumption. Always try to challenge your ideas. And do that faster. Because <laughs> the way, longer you wait, it's gonna, you're going to get more invested in that idea. Fantastic. That's it. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.